So next up, we have Matve and Odjet. Uh, I mean, you've read the title yourself, so uh, they didn't ask for any special, special introductions, so just a round of applause, everyone. <laughs> Uh, so, hi everybody, it, uh, we're really excited to be here. Uh, thank you for hosting us in the Amsterdam Ob uh, Observability Day 2023. Uh, my name is Oded, I'm leading the platform group at CoreLogix. Uh, with me, Matej, you probably know him. Um, he's an expert in observability and cloud uh, engineering. Uh, today we are going to take you on a tour on uh, the exploring the delta temporality in open telemetry. Uh, and we see if that adds up. Um, our plan for today, for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, talking about the history of uh, the observability ecosystem a bit, um, uh, diving into the open telemetry spec uh, in regards to um, temporality, cumulative, and uh, delta. Uh, from there, we'll do a deep dive into um, in practice uh, uh, with the SDKs, the collector, and probably our observability backends. And in the end, hopefully, we'll get to a conclusion or more of a confusion. Uh, we'll see. Um, so let's start. Um, so taking the observability uh, ecosystem, uh, we we're talking about a few decades ago, uh, where measurements uh, started for companies. Uh, we see that uh, companies are starting to, to, to be interested in, in measuring stuff. Uh, it can be thing, things like counting. Uh, they are starting to count their um, uh, operation behavior. Uh, it can be uh, the time it takes, uh, the, the number of calls uh, that an application did to a database. It can be um, the application uh, counting. Uh, we want to count the number of users that are currently um, connected uh, 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 to our website. And it can be more uh, interesting metrics like the, the number of coffee, coffee cups that, that my employees uh, uh, drank today. Um, and we are seeing things like uh, um, um, timing. Uh, we want to time things. We want uh, on the um, operational layer to be able to understand how much time it takes to a call to, to be uh, done to a database. Uh, we want to be able to understand application ones, like um, the, uh, the time it takes to buy a book on my website. Um, and again, uh, more uh, interesting stuff, like the time it takes to my calling to drink coffee uh, in the morning. Um, and from there, we're seeing uh, two traditions evolve. Uh, one of them is the uh, um, uh, StatsD tradition, and the next one is, uh, of course, Prometheus tradition. Um, just to do a quick poll, how many of you are using Prometheus today? I guess most of you. <laughs> how many of you are using uh, StatsD? Nice, and there are a few that probably use both. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so talking about uh, uh, StatsD a bit, so it's a bit, uh, it's a simple daemon. Um, it uh, basically aggregate data um, um, and send it to a backend uh, after a, a specific time frame, uh, mostly 10 seconds. It's run over UDP, uh, fire and forget. We don't care about the data. We just send it um, 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 uh, really, really fast. And it, uh, uh, when it sends data, it's either send it in a gouge concept, which is um, uh, the current value, or um, on a counter level, which is something like an increment um, uh, from the previous one. Um, and then we go to the Prometheus tradition, where, where, where you have HTTP client, and, and the Prometheus scrap it every uh, now and then on a specific time interval. And uh, um, it has a fully fledged uh, server TSDB database. Um, and today it can be uh, used as an agent mode, uh, um, using a remote write to uh, different backends. Um, and Prometheus doesn't really care if it's, it's, it's a gouge or, or it's counter. In the end, it uh, returned the, the current value. Um, <clears throat> now, the thing about it is that when we go to the open telemetry uh, 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 specification, uh, a new data model was emerged, and this data model basically say that um, we are talking about time series model, and we have sum, and we have gouge, and we have a, a, um, a histogram, and a exponential histogram, and so on and so on. And, and the big thing about open telemetry is that they say that when uh, we are using uh, popular existing metrics data formats, um, those can be transparently translated into open telemetry data models uh, for metrics uh, without uh, losing the semantics or the fidelity. Um, and specifically, uh, or explicitly, uh, they are talking about Prometheus and StatsD, which, where those are, uh, formats ex explicitly, explicitly uh, satisfied. Um, and in order to reach that, um, a new concept was emerged, which is uh, temporality. Um, 
so temporality uh, in the end, or aggregation temporality, means that, uh, or it defines how matrix aggregator reports and aggregated values. It basically describes how those uh, uh, values relate to the time over which they are aggregated. So when we talk about cumulative, which is how Prometheus behaves, um, the metric aggregator uh, reports changes since the fixed start time, which basically means that uh, uh, current values of uh, uh, cumulative metrics depends on all previous measurements since the start time, while talking about stats D, uh, which is more of a, a delta aggregation to parallelity, uh, metric aggregator uh, reports changes since the last report time. Uh, which, with the values of, of delta metrics, are uh, only based on, on the uh, time interval associated with uh, the last or, or the, the uh, one measurement cycle. Now, how does it look like? Um, so, uh, when we are talking about delta, um, we are starting in T0 time. Uh, we have uh, a request, a request, a request, and we finish up a uh, one second cycle. We see that we have a, a count of, of, of three uh, uh, points. And then uh, we continue to the second cycle from T0, uh, uh, from T01 to T02. Uh, we have uh, one request. This request uh, in a one, cycle, a one second cycle is again uh, um, um, being calculated, and we see that the count is one. And then we continue to the next uh, uh, one second cycle, and uh, we have another request and another request. So from T02 to T03, we have two requests, and so on and so on. Uh, the increment is based on the, the one cycle uh, time frame. And while uh, we are uh, looking at the cumulative uh, temporality, um, and sums in this case, uh, we are talking about, uh, again, uh, the first uh, uh, one second cycle. Uh, we have a request, a request, a request, and we see that from time zero to time zero one, uh, we have uh, uh, three requests. And then we have another uh, uh, one request in the next uh, uh, one second cycle, and we see that now we have four requests from T0 to T02, and go on and go on till T05. Um, basically, uh, um, uh, getting the, the current value uh, in the end. Um, I'll now add up to my uh, colleague, uh, Matej, to continue uh, the explanation uh, with a more specific uh, example. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so just to kind of finish this, uh, sorry, this is the right slide. Just to finish off um, like a little more practical example or we have like a representation of some pseudo representation of, of series. So how we would count, for example, HTTP requests um, differently with delta and cumulative. So I think it's rather self-explanatory. Again, we can think of this as happening in certain time space, so in certain intervals, T0 to T1, T1 to T2, and so on. And we have events happening during these intervals. And um, oops, sorry, it seems like it's. We have certain events happening during these intervals. And now the question is in those last two columns, we can see how we are reporting this. So when we are talking about delta, you will see that we will report uh, only the changes that are relevant during that, during that given time interval. So if we've seen a get request uh, that we responded to with status code 200, we will, uh, we will report this. On the other hand, as you see, for example, in the second interval, there are no requests incoming. So with delta, we are not reporting any new values, but with the cumulative count, we're still reporting the latest value of, of the counter. And again, if we have, for example, just 200 uh, requests coming with status code 200, so we're on delta side, we would report this increment, but on the cumulative, we are adding it to the previous value. And again, we're reporting for both uh, uh, request with status code 200 and 400. Now, we, what Odet showed and talked about, this was on the level of the whole stream. Now, let's look at the individual data points and let's look at how time works in, in relation to data points in the open telemetry data model or, or the specification. There are, two, there are two time values that are connected with data points uh, in open telemetry. One of them we can call as a, as a time of observation. The spec refers to this with, with like the technical name or the name of the actual field that we can find it in Open Telemetry Time Unix Nano. The second time we can refer to as a start time or a start of a sequence time. And I'll, I'll explain a bit what kind of sequence we're talking about. So we have two time values connected with the time point. 
with a sorry with a data point. Now talking about the time of observation, this is probably more more common and more straightforward to understand, right? This is this is the time when the actual measurement happened, or we presume that has, it has happened. So this is like the decisive timestamp. This is the time that uh, is attached to the to the data point that we that we have. This one is mandatory, so we should include it with with every data point, obviously, because we want to know we want to know when the measurement occurred. Depending on which part of the spec you're looking at, you will find this called. Uh, I mean, sorry. Dep depending on which part of open telemetry you're looking at, you can find this called. The field will be called time unix nano, or simply a timestamp. And as the time tells us, this is like a unix time uh, expressed in nanoseconds. Now, the second time, which uh, the spec refers to as star time unix nano, this this time value is less important to the individual data point, but it helps us to make sense of how data points relate to each other temporarily in the in the data stream. So it helps us to make sense of how the data points align uh, within in, in, in time. So as I said, this is less important to the individual point, but un important to understand uh, how the data points are sequenced. It's not mandatory, but it's strongly recommended for, uh, especially for sums and histograms. And this, this uh, the value is again expressed in, in Unix time in, in nanoseconds. So this second value is uh, required to correctly build what spec refers to as unbroken sequences. So this, we can think of this as, as a space in the stream where the data points build a coherent sequence and there are no kind of resets, overlaps, gaps. There are like no alignment issues between, between those points as You've seen on the example of, of the sum, which which Odette showed you, which uh, which showed like the ideal case where all, all of those time points aligned. So this is this is important to to get the correct uh, have the correct value for the counter, and maybe more importantly to be able to also cal calculate uh, rates properly. Um, how these points need to need to align? So this differs between delta and cumulative. Uh, Odette alluded to this already, so. For delta, we will be looking to always align the time Unix nano, uh, the start time Unix nano of the next point with the time Unix nano of the preceding point. And on the other hand, with the cumulative delta, all the points in, in a one stream or in, in one sequence will have the same start time, start time stem, and they will just report different uh, time Unix nano values. So let's move on to the, to the actual practice and this is I think this is what kind of where where our interest in this topic came and where we started to experiment it with and, and play with it because we had some users who were using stats D and I was like okay what's now what's this delta temporality as someone who's coming more from the Prometheus tradition or Prometheus ecosystem. So I think this is this is where, where the where things got more more interesting and we started to look at the whole pipeline and started to think Okay, what's what's happening with the, the data temporality in different stages of as we're as we're going through the collector uh, pipeline and we're processing those data points, and how how this can affect the the temporality and the actual data and how how it comes out at the end of the pipeline, right? So I'll I'll move from from all of uh, from all of the different uh, through all of the different components from the client side all the way to the to the backends. So if we begin at the client side, uh, obviously you can, you, know, you can, so you have multiple options, which kind of protocols or formats you want to use to send the data to collector. So you can, you can use the, the, what we already mentioned, the tradition, the traditional uh, things that come from outside of the open telemetry itself, like Prometheus, StatsD, I'll keep using these two as examples since we mentioned them as the traditions from which we're coming. So here, there's really, although we can kind of think think of them as, as having different aggregation temporality, the notion of temporality doesn't really exist in in Prometheus or StatsD. It's not part of that format or protocol. So like we have no choice of, or we have no control over this. We're just sending sending the data. Or we're providing the data to to the collector. Whereas if you decide to, or if you use instrumentation from the Open Telemetry, if you use the Open Telemetry SDK. This is this is native to Open Telemetry, so you you have the possibility to choose the aggregation temporality, 
and you can uh, so you have more more options to configure this and by default according to the specification uh, open telemetry will use cumulative temporality but you can you can uh, switch this to delta now then we move on to the collector hopefully most of you are at least somewhat familiar with it but we have different components uh, responsible for different parts of the part of the pipeline so we have receivers which are all kind of the first touch point in the collector. There we have processors which can do some sort of processing of the data. And then we have exporters when it's coming at the other side of the pipeline and then we're sending it to our observability backend. So as I said, receivers are kind of the, the first touch point where the data is coming in. And in this step, the, the, so the, the data will be translated or tran transformed. I guess translated is a better version, a better, better term. From, from, the, from the protocol or for, from the format of the client to the actual representation that is used in the collector. This is called pipeline data. You can find it as, as a P data. And um, so this is also where the decision which temporality to use comes into play. So obviously, it might not be possible to, to choose temporality because if statsd gives you just the delta values, you have to use the delta temporality. On the other hand, if you have the cumulative values, you need to translate this as a cumulative temporality. So this is all where the receivers which come into play, they, they take care of this and they then translate this into, into the temporality that's understandable for us within, within open telemetry and within, within collector. Obviously, this is different with the, if you use the open telemetry SDK, the, the kind of native way to send data, because then it's kind of translated one to one. If you use delta temporality, then it can be translated also to delta temporality in the pipeline data uh, format. Moving on to processors. So processors, uh, as I said, with, with this can we can do some manipulation of the data points. I think there are three processors that can be of particular interest to people uh, who are working with, with the with temporality or who are thinking about how temporality works in collector. And it's the cumulative to delta processor. This one is usually kind of bundled or, or thought of together with the delta to rate uh, processor. So the first one allows us to take, simply take cumulative values and turn them into, into delta values. And usually then this can be used, piped into the tel delta to rate processor that can then Output us give give us directly uh, rates as, as gauges, so you can you can get the rate values or the rate representation directly from those cumulative values. Um, so you can you can use you can use this uh, independently or both together. We'll also talk a little bit about when you can use cumulative to delta by itself. And transform processor. This one is uh, I would say more uh, requires more. I don't know if expertise or more, it's, it's requires, it gives you more power, so it requires more, kind of more knowledge or more paying more attention, because this processor uses the open telemetry transformation language, which is like a uh, language within open telemetry that uh, makes it possible for you to define certain transformations of the data uh, with, with, within, the, within the open telemetry. So you can, with this, you can also manipulate the aggregation temporality of those data points. There are also some helper functions that are part of, of the processor, like, for example, converting gauge to sum, where you can, you can then change monoto monotonicity or aggregation temporality. But it's, uh, it's, uh, you should take caution when you use this one, because like, it, can, it doesn't prevent you from doing some unsound transformations or doing something that goes maybe against the specification or against some, some conventions. So. Um, it's, uh, I, I would recommend to look at it only if you have very specific use case. Lastly, when exporting to your backends, and arguably this can be one of the decisive factors when you're, when you're also looking at whether to use delta or cumulative temporality. So uh, we can split this into two parts. On, on one hand, we have uh, exporters, which are at the last stage of the pipeline. Again, we're translating the pipeline the, the pipeline format back to the format that we want to output this in. And here we need to be mindful of how the 
exporter will translate the, the data. And the, the caveat is that not all exporters will be able to transform all, all of the data. I think good example, I think right now, is the Prometheus Remote Write exporter that is not, um, is not handling all of the, all of the um, data points with delta, temp uh, sorry, all of the data points with delta temporality, and um, it might drop some of, some, of the, some of the data. It will give you warnings or, or errors, but you need to, so if, if something like that happens, you should be aware of that, and you need to pay attention to that. And like the, the other side of the coin is then your backends, whether you're using your, either you're running your, some, your own solution or you're sending the data to a, uh, your, your vendor. Uh, I think you should be also aware how, how the data ends up uh, on, the, on the other side of the pipeline. Uh, I think here it's good to check either documentation or check, um, check the documentation of, of the tool you're using or your vendor, because some vendors might support or might prefer um, data with, that is provided to them as a, with, with delta mm -hmm. temporality. Others might prefer cumulative and so on. So again, it's like important to understand what happens once the data lands in, in, your, in your backend. And here, if you're interested, you can also take a look into the spec. There are some guidelines how, how the transformation uh, happens, especially with delta to cumulative, because in the end, when, we're, when we keep sending the delta values, they need to be aggregated somewhere uh, in the pipeline. And if this happens at the back, uh, at, at the end of the pipeline in your um, backend, it's good to understand how, how this transformation occurs. And also, interesting one can be uh, to look at how open telemetry protocol is transformed to Prometheus. This is, there's also certain guidance in the spec. And for example, Grafana Mimir, which supports uh, ingestion of, of metrics in the open telemetry, in the OTLP format, uh, and then translates it into Prometheus, which is like native to, to Mimir. Um, so they, they specifically uh, refer to this, to this guidance. So that can help you understand, like if you send some uh, data points with delta temporal sorry data points with delta temporality you can you can gain an understanding of how they will be transformed and how, how will they end up on the other side so just a short conclusion I think there is like no perfect end-to-end -end solution so if you're using one or the or the other you kind of as you go through those different steps in the pipeline it's good to think about what what happens with with those data points uh, and how, how they will end up on the other side of the pipeline, especially, uh, it's especially good to pay attention if any data can be can be dropped, and when reasonable, you can you can opt to transform to delta, whether this is because your backend pre prefers delta, or whether, um, or, or or you want to do some further processing of of the data points, so you go from cumulative to delta to to rate, and. I think that's, that's where we ended. Thank you.